Which president of NSPI this year, and uh, welcome to our NSPI annual conference here in Atlanta. They get to do a lot of work. <laughs> Many of you haven't figured that out probably because I've been having a great time. However, there is one special thing that the president gets to do, and that's to select the three invited speakers. And that's the president's prerogative. And when I became president-elect, uh, my first thought was keynote breakfast. I'm very linear, so I started with the <laughs> keynote breakfast. And the very first person I thought of for the keynote breakfast is the person who has accepted to be our keynote speaker today, and that's Margot Murray Hicks. Now, I'm the sort of person that likes to go and collect some data. So here is a data sheet on Margot Murray, Murray Hicks. This is the respectable data, of course. <laughs> the unrespectable data, see Joe Harless. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, Margot has been a member of NSPI since the mid-1960s, which makes her older than me. <laughs> Secondly, she served on the executive board as a national vice president, 1971-72, and Diane knows what that means. She's served almost every year before and since on some national committee, and the one that I want to point out to you was the most delightful committee of all. In the move of the national office one year, we lost all our historical records on the bylaws. It's an exciting task to try and track down and find out which were the real bylaws of the society. And so we thought, who could we get to do that? And we gave this wonderful opportunity to Margot Murray Hicks, who did it so competently that we now know what bylaws we have. And I think that was one of the greatest accomplishments in the history of NSPI. Um, Margot also, I know, was sitting there looking at Esther and smiling knowingly because Margot not only managed one conference, she managed two conferences for the Society, uh, both in 1973 and 79. In 19, 78, excuse me. In 1979, she won the Outstanding Member Award. What else? Only normal for such a super person. Presently, she's a member of our senior advisory panel, and uh, that senior advisory panel, of course, is the senior staff group of NSPI, all very dedicated individuals who give their own time and use their own money and resources to come together several times a year to help NSPI in all types of things that it's doing and work for the board and with the board, including the incoming board has all, they've all been trained, they all have performance standards. Fortunately, I'm leaving, I didn't have to go for that. Um, now, at this point, you might think that Margot only works for NSPI. Uh, she also has to work for a living, and Margot Mur uh, Murray Hicks and Associates Incorporated just celebrated their 10th anniversary. Um, prior to that, Margot was with Pacific Telephone for 11 years in management, and prior to that, eight years with the U.S. Air Force. Um, Margot has had so much real-world experience that she looks upon what she does as sort of a laboratory of empirical research in our field that she can draw on, and that, she feels, gives her the strength to apply our technologies and to make them evolve. Besides her practical work, this woman also has a very strong academic record with a master's in business administration and postgraduate work in business and in the behavioral sciences. So there are some facts about Margot. Just a couple of non-facts about Margot. Oh, let me add one more. Most important one of all, she's five feet eight in her stocking feet. That's very important because the non-fact is I always thought she was six feet four. <laughs> and the reason for that is because she is such a strong person. When she walks into a room, she fills it. Not with her size, but with her presence and her competence. Um, 
I'm an admirer of Margot's, and I'm also in awe of her. Somehow or other, when I see her, just her appearance makes a statement, and that statement I'd like her to share with us today, Margot Murray Hicks. Sage Indian ancestors described the experience of empathy as walking a mile in my moccasins. Well, I'd like you to share the excitement of standing on this stage right now by standing with me and shaking in my socks. <laughs> Can you envision what I felt when Harold called me last fall and asked me to give the key note that would set us on our way to a productive conference. There was a surge of excitement. There was a lot of honor involved in that. There was fear almost bordering on panic at times. A challenge for me because I knew I would be speaking with my professional colleagues. Uh, a lot of pride because of that. We as a group are diverse in our interests, in our professions, in our values, and in our philosophies. Harold, Harold said it very well in his column in the March issue of our journal when he said we are professionals. We systematically apply a, an acquired body of scientifically derived practice to build learning and improved human performance. This was the challenge. What could I talk about that would be of interest to such a diverse group and that would also start us on our way to this exciting conference? Themes flashed through my head. <laughs> First of all, I began to think about getting over the shakes, and then I thought, what about computers in 1984? Are they potentially an effective instructional resource for us, or do they pose the Orwellian threat that we've been warned about? My speculation is that future shock may be no more than a tingle when you consider the present pressures on the people in our profession. I want to express something more exciting and more directly relevant to the mission of this organization this morning. And Harold encouraged that inclination with his guidance that I describe some of the sources of my strength and that I provoke the participants at this conference to action that will make a significant impact on the lives and the development of our constituency. I began to assess what we are and what we do. Imagine this, applying an element of our technology to this awesome task. All of us in this room in some way influence people. We are consultants, we are teachers, we are managers, we are supervisors, we are trainers, we are coaches, we are developers of learning material. Some of us are parents and all of us are learners. We go to others as experts in what we do, and we influence them. We advise current leaders and future leaders, and we influence a wide range of people, and yet not enough. When you are selected as keynote speaker for this conference, I want it to be easier for you to brag about it. It was awfully tough for me, because my attempts very often met with the response, what is an SPI? <laughs> my theme, History, Her Story, and Vision is about what leadership has been in the past and how those who have been called leaders have influenced human achievement and what leadership means to me personally. It's about the lack of survival skill training that I see among young people and it's about why we who do have this influence must set new models of leadership for the future. It's about my vision as to how we as influencers and leaders and role models can bring a new kind of leadership to the world. This must sound like an ambitious project, so I'll begin promptly with history. What is our leadership? Those of you who are business students know that the two classic models of leadership have been the Catholic Church and the United States Army. <laughs> The church has a traditional hierarchy of men, from the parish priests to the bishops, the cardinals, and then to the pope. 
As a church leader gains rank, it becomes more difficult for the lay person to get an audience with him. I know, in some organizations, a hierarchy is essential. But what is important is the image that's conveyed about leadership. As leaders gain power, they are more distant. This suggests that inaccessibility makes one more effective. The lay person learns that communication with leaders is difficult, intimidating, and inappropriate. The supplicant with initiative and vision begins to use the direct line of prayer just to cut through the red tape and to feel that someone is listening. That was the course used by the little old Italian woman who was praying in the chapel. A playful painter who was hidden from her decided to have some fun and called down, this is your Lord, acknowledge me. And the woman continued to pray. And the painter, in a deeper, sterner voice, as Bob says, if they don't get it the first time, say it again louder, said, Woman, this is your Lord. Acknowledge my presence. Somewhat annoyed, the woman looked up and said, Shut your mouth, boy. Can't you see I'm talking to your mama? <laughs> The other organizational model, the U.S. Army, has similar characteristics of separateness. The division is sharp and horribly clear. There are the leaders and there are those who are led. It's the officers versus the men. Officers are unapproachable and intimacy between ranks is taboo. Others, great in the history of the world, use the same style of leadership. Martin Luther and Mahatma Gandhi tended to ignore those who were closest to them while they worked for the glory of God. Causes became paramount to relationships. Values were taught from a distance. The message was again conveyed, to be great, to be accomplished, one must remain at a distance from the confusing and distracting involvement of human relationships. It's my opinion that these historical figures were not leaders. They were crusaders. They were looking to achieve goals at the price of human creativity and closeness. With these models, it's not surprising that many managers and administrators avoid intimate contact with people. They work for the glory of the gods of power and profit, and they tend to ignore the people who are at the base of production. Perhaps John Lennon said it very well, captured the essence of this message in the recording, I Don't Want to Face It, when he says, you want to save humanity, but it's people you just can't stand. I'm not saying that these historical crusaders' goals were not worthy. Their contributions to us were great. I am saying that a true leader has vision, skills, and strength with compassion. I often hear that intimacy and leadership are incompatible. This week the world focuses on one of our major religious holidays, and that brings into focus the current Pope of the Catholic Church, Pope John Paul II. He's jokingly referred to as Papa Mass Media by some, but he's a man who has challenged the world politically and morally, a man who has survived assassination attempts and forgiven his would-be murderer. This summer, he gave audiences twice weekly in Rome without the benefit of bulletproof glass to separate him from the people. He communicated courage, faith, and strength by being close. In Harold's March column in our journal, he talks of our connection with our professional society and our professional family. I must say that that type of leadership is not easy for men who grew up with the separatist model. The essential characteristics of connection are more often exhibited by women. That's not meant as an exclusionary challenge, George. It is meant to invite sharing and growth in capacities that will enrich the lives and enhance the strengths and skills of all people who choose to lead. So let me to my second theme, her story, or my story, and how I came to learn about leadership and what it can be. One of the wonderful things about growing older is that one has a large database of experience to use as a sieve for what has value and for what is worthless.
Another is that one's sententious statements are more likely to be tolerated. So having already been told that I am older than Harold and a number of the others of you, I will say that today at the sunrise of my senility, <laughs> I will express and illustrate for you six of Margot's maxims that have become the general rules for my leadership model and for my living. These maxims are offered to you as a menu and not as a mandate. They won't fit all of you. But first, some background. I was raised in the backwoods of Missouri. On my, on my first day of school, I found myself in a one-room country schoolhouse. There was a big, round, pot-bellied stove in the middle of it, but there was no fire in it on that particular day because it was late summer and it was hot. You see, our school started in August so that we could be through with the academics by a time for spring planting. I settled into my seat with great expectations. I was five years old. The assignments were given out in that school class by class, beginning with the first graders. And so I received my assignment and finished it. And I was eager to move on to the next thing, so I turned to help the student behind me. The teacher came and stopped me. She took me by the shoulders and turned me back around in that seat. And no mention was made of my finished assignment. So much for immediate feedback, Don. Nor did she say anything about my willingness to help a classmate. I guess peer instruction hadn't yet been discovered. What she said was, you must sit quietly and face the front of the classroom. Now imagine what this felt like to me. I lived on a 200-acre farm where learning and exploration were encouraged and expected. My insatiable curiosity had already emerged, and the work ethic had been eloquently modeled for me by my parents. At five years old, I had responsibilities for gathering eggs, for caring for the animals, and for helping with the garden. Suddenly, with that stern turning of my shoulders and those harsh words, my curiosity and initiative had been stopped, stifled. I'm reminded at this point of a story of a man with a beloved pet parakeet. His wife was not so enamored of this bird, and it tended to pick holes in the furniture and the drapes, so she insisted that something be done about it. So the man acquiesced and went off to the local hardware store to buy a file to take the beak off the bird. The store owner was aghast and said, you can't do that because the parakeet's beak is a specialized tool. It's designed to crack the hulls of seed pods, and if you take the beak off, the parakeet will starve. But the man insisted, bought the file, and proceeded to the task. A week or so later, these two happened to meet on the street, and the hardware store owner inquired about the parakeet. The man replied that it was dead. And the hardware store owner said, I told you that if you took off its beak, it would starve. And the man said, oh no, that wasn't it at all. The poor little thing was dead when I took it out of the vise. <laughs> now, I was luckier than the parakeet. Immediately after the teacher tried to put me in her vise, I ran from the schoolhouse, horrified that school meant sitting still instead of learning and exploring. I could not accept such a restriction on my freedom, even at the age of five. I spent the rest of the day in the shed that sheltered the well. In my own five-year-old way, I pushed back against the vice-like grip of rigid structure and traditional approaches. This has become a tenet of my functioning and one of my maxims. That was, glad to say, not the only time I questioned an environment or a person who was rigid and inflexible. Harold mentioned I'd worked for the United States Air Force and for the Pacific Telephone Company. More than once in those large organizations, my values for efficiency and positiveness were stifled by a bureaucratic block or a supervisor who would not listen or be courageous enough to change the rules. I learned the importance of pushing back and questioning authority, and it does work both ways, so that when my methods are questioned, I pause and listen to see if something more can be learned. I know that providing inspiring leadership is not an easy task. It's a lesson I learned not only in my professional career, but in my role as a mother and in my desire to be a good mother. You might ask, how does being a mother teach one the necessary traits of good leadership?
Let me read to, read to you a short passage from a book called Jan and Dio from the 30s by Tilly Olson. <clears throat> Bess, who has been fingering a fruit jar lid absently, heedlessly dropped it, aimlessly groping across the table, reclaims it again, lightning in her brain. She releases, grabs, releases, grabs. I can do. Bang. I did that. I can do. I, I. A look of Neanderthal concentration is on her face. That noise. In triumphant, astounded joy, she bangs the lid down. Slam, whack, release, grab. Centuries of human drive work in her. Human ecstasy of achievement satisfaction as deep and fundamental as sex. I can do, I use my powers, I, I. And here it is, the challenge of leadership that parents have had for centuries. How to nurture the creativity, encourage the growth, keep the human spirit intact in our children while we teach them to function in a society of rules. How to work healthfully with a balance of freedom and authority. From my experiences with my own family and with my work and with my respected colleagues, I observed and adopted the second of Margot's maxims. Live with your values. My values must always be clear to myself and to those around me. I must live within my values. And one of those values is intimacy. Without the ability to be close to others, all my other skills are worthless. Carol Gilligan, psychologist and associate professor at Harvard, states, women's knowledge comes not from detachment, but from living in connection with themselves and with others, from being embedded in the conditions of life. This maxim then says, get close. Without close communication, all talent or action is impotent. In persuading me to do this keynote address, Harold commented on my selfless contribution to our, to our society, even to the bylaws. I believe that work is as natural to human beings as is play. The key, of course, is to find work that is rewarding and satisfying to us. We can't just wait for someone to play howdy doody with the strings. The key is that we must take responsibility for our own growth and development and our own direction. I believe when I see something worth doing that if it is to be, at least part of it is up to me. I believe that we must give as well as take from our professional society. Another one that fits my model of leadership and living is be good. And I mean just that. Do not aim for perfection because aiming for perfection can trap us in our own insecurities and make us unwilling to take risks that will help us to grow, unwilling to share or to gain. And this is not to suggest mediocrity. It is to suggest that we take a careful look at the standards for each task, set the standards at an appropriate level for that task and for ourselves, and aim to be good. Humans have a tendency to chalk some achievements, especially those of other people, up to luck. Or we sometimes say, someone up there is looking out for him or her. Well, as I study lucky achievers, I find some common, or perhaps we should say uncommon, characteristics. They have vision. They have clear values. They have goals and a willingness to work to achieve them. I believe that they are walking to meet their luck. And that's another of my maxims. It's my vision that a new model of leadership can be activated with the application of some or all of these simple concepts. And they do seem simple, right? We're responsible professionals, so why should I su suggest that you do anything different in your life? Harold asked me to provoke you to think about some actions, and that lets me share with you some of the concerns that I have about how effective we NSPI members are as role models. How skillfully are we applying what we know about leadership? By design or by accident, we influence others. How are we using the power of our profession? 
I'm concerned about the lack of professionalism that I see in some of us. I'm concerned that we sell our services with no guarantee of results to those who have faith in our abilities. I'm concerned when I see organizations wasting money with inefficiency within them. And I'm concerned that millions of people do not know about NSPI. I'm concerned that we're not spending enough time on ourselves, on clarifying our own values. I might, I might put the 800 or 1,000 of you here on the spot and ask you, how many of you have a personal development plan where you have your values and needs and interests very clearly stated and your goals specified, including your goals for your personal growth and for giving to this organization where you came this week to gain? How can we coach others in those essential foundations until we are living with those values? It's a tragic waste of human resources to expect each succeeding generation to learn any skill by trial and error when some competency in that skill exists in the present generation. And yet we avoid teaching and talking about relationship skills as if they were the plague. Many organizations are plagued with lack of communication, with poor productivity, with job burnout, with costly breakdowns in their human resources because leaders lack relationship skills. The state of our educational system in this country is pathetic. The statistical abstract of the United States would have us believe that functional illiteracy has decreased. But take a look at what has happened to the definition of illiteracy in this century. Changing the definition does not change the fact that basic survival skills are not being learned. Did you know that in our public schools in some cities, 40 to 46 percent of the students are absent on any given day? There's a message there. The environment is aversive. There's a lack of leadership and the role models are not attractive. There's no stimulus to grow or to create. And so our classrooms become dead space, paid for by our taxes every day, empty or full. And this backfires on all of us eventually because the lack of skills makes people unprepared for either further academic work or for industry or the professions. So it's an appropriate task for us, supposed experts in human behavior, to create new models for the schools. Some school people talk about goals and objectives, but what learning model do they offer to young people? I haven't yet seen a school where they teach goal setting, stress management, or good study habits. Students don't practice skills. Rather, they are exposed to some sort of content. How important do you think it is to teach interpersonal skills? I could answer this with some sad statistics, and I'll skip those, but the essence of the message is that the suicide rate among young people, teenagers, is climbing every year in this country. And what are the causes? Young people lack vision. They have no goals. They're in a state of despair without coping skills. How do we lead them to a fuller, more satisfying life? To office with it, passive and defensive traits. We must learn to encourage each learner to set goals and personal objectives. And more importantly, we must find the resources that will help them to learn the key survival skills. Competency leads to confidence and the genesis of a positive self-image. That school environment must become a healthy one again. And that responsibility lies with us as parents, as professionals in human resource development, and as members of this human community. We must get close to change that environment. We live in a world where our survival may depend on our sense of connection. That fact has implications for a very different kind of leader. A leader who emulates not Big Brother, but the connected leadership of mothers. Intimacy does not exclude respect. A leader who has vision and can get close will also lead in productive human effort. The basics of learning must include the affective skills of interaction. My vis is a return to the basic skills that are essential even in the most technologically advanced society. 
The three R's of reading, writing, and arithmetic continue to be classic critical skills. I suggest we add a fourth R, the R for relationships. Interpersonal skills are learned by children early in life, and yet some schools stifle that natural learning process by forcing them to maintain distance and separateness. How can we revive it? I have three suggestions, and I expect that with the creativity among this group that you'll generate a great number more by the end of this conference. The Foster Grandparent Program can provide models of healthy relationships to young people. We can use them in daycare centers. A second way would be to provide academic credit for, co for community involvement with people at the elementary school and secondary school level. In this way, responsibility can be learned and positive self-images can be enhanced. A third suggestion is for each of you to reach two. Become a mentor to two young people. Help them to learn the essential skills of working in close relationship with others. Model for them this connected leadership and recruit them to membership in an SPI. <laughs> Can you envision how exciting it would be next year in Chicago if each of you had reached two other people in that way? While being big may be bad or good in the eyes of some, being good can be better. So I encourage you to practice relationships, and this conference is a prime forum for building those. It's an opportunity to test our skills with connection, to try out being close, and to assess whether our espoused values of improving human behavior are our operating values. Did you come to conference with a personal plan for your own growth through the facilities that are being offered here? I hope your expectations for this conference are as high as mine were on that first day of school. This environment is certainly different. But how can you be sure that your expectations will be met? If it is to be, it's up to me. I present one action plan for your consideration, and that's to meet with at least four other people during this conference. Offer your idea for improving human performance by reaching to others. Refine your idea with the feedback from your colleagues and polish it by rubbing it against the grain of their helpful and loving criticism. Watch it being handled and refined without defensiveness or protectiveness on your part. You'll have more than a refined idea when you finish. You will have had the experience of productive human interaction. And that's our priority task here to open ourselves up to those around us and to these human experiences. This may lead to discovering ourselves and to stronger ties with our professional family. But don't limit the experience to an experiment here. Take these techniques and concepts back with you into your work environments and more importantly into your communities where you can impact people earlier in their lives. Help the young people with whom you come into contact find the fine balance point between freedom and responsibility or authority. Teach them how to be close, how to live in connection. We meet this week in the birthplace of Martin Luther King, Jr., who is well known for his ability to work closely with his followers, and yet he held them responsible for results. When he said, I have a dream. He ignited enthusiasm and support in thousands of people. Say to yourself, I have a vision. I am a leader. I am a role model with healthy, successful relationships. I am an active, contributing member of our professional family. Then make that vision a reality.
be intimate. It's a bit dark up here. And there's no one around. Um, Margot, uh, I'm going to just take two pieces out of your speech. You were good. <laughs> you were terrific. Um, the message that you provided us, I think, is a wonderful, wonderful way to start off this conference, and that was the purpose of it. I said to Margot, give us something to make us think and provoke us, and I think you've done both. You are fabulous. The second that I'm going to apply now is, get close. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.